So, um, the purpose of this year was to look at the books of the. We're always looking at how much. Yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're, I'm just going to mute uh, you for yourself. now. Or you're welcome to unmute oh. later. Right. Okay. Feel free to unmute if you have a question. I think it's just it's it's echoing for some reason. Um, okay, so we often learn Chumash. We don't really learn much of Tanakh, so we thought we'd have a little look at the books of the prophets. Um, you've got it on your sheet. Can I get to the next few minutes? Um, so <clears throat> and we, it's really small. I'm really sorry. Can you guys actually see that? I can't see that. It's really small. Can you see it, Jim? Sorry. Okay. So you've got on the right, you've got, we, we, when we talk about Tanakh, it's Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Torah is Chumash, five books, in the right-hand column there. Then you have Nevi'im, which we'll look at in a minute, the prophets. And Ketuvim is, uh, is writings. So in Nevi'im, you have the major prophet, which is Joshua, who is a prophet. The Judges, Book of Judges. The Book of Shmuel, Samuel 1 and 2. Kings 1 and 2, which are all sort of um, quite historical in their nature. Um, not so much kind of, when you think of the half Torahs from like Ezekiel and Isaiah, and they're much more kind of allegorical. Um, the first few books are pretty much quite historical, re recounting the history of the Jewish people over hundreds of years, if not thousands. Um, and then you have like the, the classic prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Hosea, not to be confused with Joshua. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sorry, he's the first of the 12 minor prophets. So the major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And then you have what we call the 12 minor prophets, which is in one book. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Avadia, Jonah, Micha, Nachum, Chavakuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So they're all in the 12. Uh, morning, Pam. Julian's got the sheets. I'm sorry, it's come out really small. And I couldn't work out how to project my PowerPoint. So next week, we'll figure it out. But Julian's got the sheets for you. But they're, they're very small prints. So... Um, and then you've got the writings, which is basically the Psalms, the Tehillim, the Proverbs of King Solomon, the Book of Job, the Five Megillot, and finally you have Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles, which all chronicle the sort of end of, you know, the time close to the structure of the Second Temple and beyond. Um, so Tanakh starts, prophets start with the Book of Joshua. Before we come on to the actual Book of Joshua, we're just going to look a little bit at what a prophet actually is. Book of Joshua, there we go. Right, so... This is source number three. Um, does anyone want to try to read or is the print too small? Oh, yeah. You have a go. Go for it. The first place and the king removed his ring from his hand. <clears throat> right, so this is the Gomorrah. I can't hear anything at all, Rabbi. I couldn't hear a thing. Yeah, that was sorry. Julian was just reading, so I'll just, I'll, okay, I guess I'll read for now. Okay, so this is just a quote from Megillah from the Talmud. It says, when it says in the Megillah, the king took his ring off his hand by Haman and he gave it to Haman, right? To seal the fate of the Jewish people. So Rabbi Abba Kahana says that this basically, this act, which ultimately at the time was a terrible existential threat to the Jews, was more effective than the 48 prophets and the seven prophetesses who gave prophecy on behalf of the Jewish people. They failed to get the Jewish people to do Teshuvah. The proof is the temple was destroyed twice, and we're now in exile. But Achashverosh's ring being removed, in other words, basically his to seal the decree against the Jews, was more effective for Teshuvah in the time of Mordechai than all the prophets. Right? There's no atheist in a foxhole. When you feel threatened, you immediately pray to God, or you do Teshuvah. Correct. It didn't solve all the problems. That's actually incidental. The real reason we're quoting that is to talk about prophets. So it says in the Talmud, there were 48 prophets and seven prophetesses. You're probably already wondering who are those 48 prophets, because I just showed you on the screen probably about 25. 
So the Gemara does discuss exactly who they were, but I have a question. How many prophets were there actually? Anybody know the answer? There were a lot more. If we look at the next sheet. So the sages taught in the Bible, so 48 prophets and seven prophetesses prophesied on behalf of the Jewish people. They neither subtracted from nor added onto what is written in the Torah, no changes or additions to mitzvot, except for the reading of the Megillah, which they added as an obligation for future generations. This is an interesting one. You don't have mitzvot from Tanakh. We right? have 630 mitzvot in the Torah. We have certain rabbinic things, which came later, like washing your hands for bread or lighting Shabbat candles. The prophets did not enact mitzvot. They didn't generally change them either. So the one exception, which is one of the seven rabbinic commandments, is the reading of the Megillah. I can think of another exception, actually, which I've always wondered about. Because we have what we call Doraita, which is Torah commandments, or what we call Dorabon, which is rabbinic commandments. Many of us in Kiddush every Shabbos, and we've learned this before, say, Im tashiv mishabas raglecha, this quote from Isaiah, if you will refrain on my Sabbath day from your weekday tasks, then I will bless you. And it says, you shall speak differently, you shall walk differently. And we learn a whole load of halachas of Shabbos from here. The idea that you shouldn't sort of, you should have a leisurely stroll on Shabbos and not run places. The idea that you shouldn't talk about business or stocks comes from Isaiah. So some of the laws of Shabbos actually come from the section of Isaiah. So that comes to mind as well. I think that's quite unusual. Most of the prophets are not giving you mitzvot. They're giving you basically history or what happened in the past. In many cases, Joshua, certainly King um, Judges is very much historical or predictions for the future or basically warnings what will happen if you misbehave with prophecy. So it's not there to add mitzvot, God forbid, or take away mitzvot. The one exception that Gemara mentions is the Megillah. Anyway, the real reason I brought this was for the next bit. In fact, says the Talmud, there were more prophets, as it was taught in the Brisa. Many prophets arose for the Jewish people, numbering double the number of Israelites who left Egypt. Right, do your maths. How many left Egypt? 600,000. That's 1.2 million prophets. I don't know what the total Jewish population is. That's an awful lot of prophets. However, only a portion of the prophecies were recorded because only that that was needed for future generations was written in the Bible for posterity. Excuse me. That which was not needed was not pertinent, was not written. Somebody once asked me, how come in the Tanakh we only ever read Jewish history? What about the history of the ancient Chinese? I said, are you kidding me? I said, even the Jewish history is often a part of history. You'll have hundreds of years in one chapter. So there's a limit to what you can include in any history book. Otherwise, it becomes, you know, it's wonderful when you have these huge, fat, you know, 20 volume books, a brief history of whatever, but it's not manageable. So it seems there were actually millions of prophets. So there are prophets on every street corner. So it wasn't something that was unique to very, very special people. Many people had some degree of prophecy. You only hear about the ones that were the sort of, it's like football players, right? everyone complains, or doctors. Everyone says, oh, football players get overpaid. Doctors get overpaid, they get paid so much, it's ridiculous, hundreds of thousands, right? And anyone in the business will tell you, you only hear about the guys at the top that make it. You don't hear about all the struggling junior doctors who can barely pay their mortgages. You don't hear about the, you know, fourth division footballers who are not earning millions. You only ever hear about the guys at the top. It's the same with the profits, I don't think they earn millions, but nowadays they probably would, they've gone book tours and things, but um, it's the same with the profits. We only hear about the significant ones. But just by the way, there were many, many more according to the Talmud. Um, so this is the Gomorrah in Megillah. So, okay, so what is a prophet? Let's define a prophet. We're about to read the section of Nach, of Nevi'im, of prophets. What is a prophet? Who's the most famous prophet of all? Don't say Muhammad, please. Moshe, right? Amongst other things. We'll see shortly, God says there never arose a prophet in Israel like Moshe. He wasn't just a prophet, of course, he was a leader as well. Now, many prophets were leaders. Joshua was a prophet. And then you had people like Samuel who were sort of slightly more reclusive, who were in the shadows. You know, he was the one that basically, he was the kingmaker. He was the one, we'll see, hopefully we get to the book of Samuel. He's the one that uh, 
so poor, poor King Saul throughout his life is tormented. He's out looking for his father's donkeys, which have gone missing. And Shmuel comes up and says, would you like to be king? He says, oh, not quite like this. He says, well, not really. He says, well, you know, too bad, because God said you're going to be king. And next thing he knows, you know, he went out to look for donkeys, came back with a crown, and he's king. Uh, and being a king, it seems that prophecy was basically something that kings are expected to have as well. And uh, Saul, they had, I mean, this is all very Harry Potter. They had prophet schools. You didn't just become a prophet overnight. You didn't make a prophet overnight. You had well, a bit of pepper to the uh, salmon. Yeah. I've already done it. Oh, good. You, you already added pepper. <laughs> yes. Okay, no, that. Uh, yeah, I've I've added added the black pepper. pepper. So they had prophet schools. I think they're making dinner there. Uh, they had prophet schools, and people had to go through prophet school, and you had to get your degree, and presume you know you had to pay your tuition fees. And so when Saul was appointed out of the blue. He was this character that comes out of nowhere. He wasn't in the hierarchy of the prophets. They actually all said, who is this guy? And the phrase they used is, is Saul among the prophets now? And apparently, I've never heard this in common usage, but apparently until probably 50 years ago, this was a phrase. In America, they say, you just got off the boat. Like if you want to basically say to someone, who are you? You know, you've just, you, you've just appeared. You know, you've just got here yesterday and suddenly you're telling us all what to do. So is Saul among the prophets was a way of saying like, who is this guy? Who put him in charge? He's got, he doesn't have any credentials. It was a way of putting someone down, you know, that you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not the real deal. Um, so it seems to come from Tanakh. I don't think anyone uses that phrase nowadays. It seems, if you look it up in like phrase books, it seems to have been a, an ancient English phrase. He's Saul among the prophets. So pr they had prophet schools and what have you. Anyway, so what is a prophet? Um, let's have a look. So Rambam in his Laws of the Foundations of the Torah, chapter 10, verse 1 says... <clears throat> He says, um, it would help if I was recording. Whoops, one second. Oh, no, I am recording. Sorry. Right. He says, <clears throat> every prophet who will arise among us and say he is the messenger of God <clears throat> is not obliged to deliver a token, like on the tokens of Moshe or Elijah or Elisha where there's a change in the natural laws of the universe. Right? In other words, right, what did, how did Moshe prove his worth? We know, through signs and wonders, right? He came to the people and he performed miracles. And that presumably helped his credibility. Right? Elijah revived the dead, right? Or the, the prophets of Baal. Um, I don't know what miracle Elisha did today on that. Yeah, sorry, he was also by with the Shunna, yeah, with the Shunnamite woman. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So, for them, there were miraculous things that showed who they were. But says the random, uh, sorry, the Rambam, his token, his sign could should be that he foretells things, or she, by the way, they were female prophets, right? Prophetesses, by foretelling things which are to come to pass in the world, and the words come true, as it says, if you will say in your heart, right, Devarim, it says, how will you know that the word of the, the, the prophet is speaking the word of the Lord and not just making it up? So we say when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the thing follows doesn't happen or doesn't come to pass, then this is something the Lord has not spoken about. And therefore you presume that he's speaking from his own mind rather than from <clears throat> um, what God has told him to. Um, so the classical understanding, by the way, of a prophet, the prophet is called the Navi. Navi. So some of the commentators say Navi is a an acronym for Niv Sifatayim, which quite literally means the, the words that come out of your mouth, the utterances of your lips. Or it can also mean a preacher, one who preaches the word of God. And we find other words as well. You may have heard possibly of the seer of Lublin, the Chose of Lublin, who lived about 200 years ago. He was somebody that had a vision, right? But it wasn't quite the same as a biblical prophet. It does tell us that in the, uh, after the Time of the Second Temple, that the era of prophecy ended. So prophets, as we knew them back in the day, don't exist nowadays. So you're going to say, are there people that have some kind of divine insight? Clearly there are, because there are people that give blessings and people that predict things. And there are always great rabbis that you hear who have said things that have come true or who have given someone a bracha about something clearly, some foresight and some divine insight, but not the level that was experienced in the times of the prophets, sadly. Um, 
So what were these millions of prophets doing? So presumably they had certain insights or they had certain revelations, but it was probably quite individual. To have national revelations, to tell the Jewish people, you all this, you all that, that's already a different level. And that's something that's far less common. So to have some kind of prophecy, which was individual and personal, wasn't so unusual. But to be on a level where you were channeling the words of God to the nation, that was quite unusual. That was usually certain select special leaders, most of whom we have heard of. Those 48 uh, prophets and seven prophetesses. So what's the ratio there? Seven into 48 is about seven. Yeah. So about one in eight were female. I don't know how that compares with Fortune 500 companies today. Probably about the same, right? Um, so in some point, what about the to come out, so I understand that. <clears throat> Would they be a prophet? Let's see. Um, so let's have a look. Let's let's have a look at your question. So to answer your question, how do we know if a prophet is telling the truth or not? Right. So the so next slide it says, if a man fit for prophecy comes as a messenger of the name, right? In the name of God. And he's not coming to add or take away from the Torah, but he's advocating the service of God according to the Torah. So this is crucial. Right? So quite clear to Devarim. If someone will come and say that even one thing in the Torah you don't have to follow, then he's a false prophet. Right? The whole problem with a certain other religion is that the moment that Yashka says, if he did say, he's alleged to have said, you don't have to follow the commandments anymore. You'll fulfill it through me. That's a classic symptom of false prophecy because a real prophet will never tell you not to do mitzvot. That's the simple test of a prophet. Prophet is there to enhance your relationship with God and to enhance Torah. But prophet says, so, so I mean, the classic example, unfortunately, that happens in many cults, right, is where you've had some kind of inappropriate relationship with a cult leader who has been basically uh, violating the women in the cult, always on the premise that. God told me to, I'm saving your soul, right? And the problem, why do people fall for that? Because these are very charismatic people, but, and there's an imbalance of power. But the problem starts with the presumption that I am the conveyor of the word of God. So when I tell you that God has told me that I have to sleep with you in order to save your soul, okay, he's the prophet, you have to listen to him. Now, if you've learned a bit of Judaism, you'll say, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right because it says quite clearly, anyone who claims to be channeling God's message and it's against the Torah is clearly wrong. So sorry, mate, you're making this up on your own just because you're a pervert or whatever. So uh, it's tragic because that's what happens. And in that most extreme case, people end up, sometimes you have mass suicide as we've seen in America. So no one can say something about what they say. <clears throat> because they, are. they pass the test of authenticity. That is right. No, because they pass the test of authenticity because they were consistently get their, their, their message was consistent. They claimed to speak in the name of God. Their message was consistently consistent with the Torah. You can if you want. You won't get very far. No, it's taken as authentic. The question you should ask is, but sometimes their words didn't always come true. Not every prophecy immediately comes true. That's slightly more challenging. So we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, so by the way, the power to see the future and the power to tap into spiritual phenomena doesn't make you a prophet. So for example, uh, the Raman discusses this as well. It might be in the next slide actually, one second. No. Um, when the Torah says that you shouldn't practice black magic, you shouldn't go to soothsayers and diviners and uh, I don't know, Ouija board, whatever you call them. Um, what do they call them? Medium, media, mediums and things like that. The Torah doesn't say it doesn't work. Right? The Torah never says there's no such thing as dark spiritual phenomena. It says you shouldn't make use of them. So when someone comes along and says, yeah, I once saw a ridiculous, I think it's a ridiculous article. I think it was in the standard years and years ago. Someone came up with this whole theory that there was no revelation at Sinai. What happened is Moshe and Aaron were practitioners of the dark arts of black magic. 
and they were able to somehow bring about this uh, smoke coming out the mountain and this booming whatever voice. And so you think, which is more absurd, to believe that God came down on the mountain and spoke to people, or to believe, I don't believe in God, but I believe in, in black magic, and I believe that Moshe was, able, was, a, was some kind of a, you know, a sorcerer. I get I get emails. I'm on all these lists from these uh so Sudoku organ. So, that, so if you go to an authentic Jewish leader, you shouldn't be charging you money for it, well, right? That. No, if you go to an authentic Jewish leader, right. Right. so if you go to an authentic Jewish leader, who is a man of God, or woman, who is preaching God's laws and following God's laws, and you say to them, you know, I'm looking for a blessing for this, or I'm looking for some advice, right? It's a basic axiom, by the way, of rabbinic practice, of what we call siyat of Bishmaya, which means divine help. That when a based in are asked to pasta, or a rav is asked to pasta a question, if they do it in the right way and they put in the due diligence, they have what we call siyat of Bishmaya, they have divine help. So, and they rely on that to make the right decisions. So, so one second. So when you go to... Right, so when you go to, if you go to a holy man or you go to a, you know, a righteous person and you ask them to give you some advice or to give you a blessing and they simply channel what the Torah would say essentially, but more in, in terms that are understandable to you. So they say, well, if you look in so-and-so, it says... And that's what they often do, by the way. If you look at answers and sort of blessings, they're often based on Sukkim and the Torah. And there's no suggestion that you shouldn't do mitzvot. The suggestion is, so for example, you know, let's say, you know, I don't know, you went to see some uh, uh, Kabbalist in Israel and you said, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know, I don't know, my, my grandson needs the Shidduch and we've been trying for years and years. And, you know, what can you suggest? And they say, and they say, and they say, you should say Tehillim number 35 every morning before breakfast, and you do it, and that becomes a channel for God's blessings, right? And they don't tell you you don't have, what's the problem with the Kabbalah Center? What's the problem with Madonna, right? What's the problem with all these things? And they don't preach. Yeah, he's an interesting one. Yes. I mean, Right. So, crucial point the fact that someone's blessing comes true or their prediction comes true, they could be a false prophet. There are quote unquote dark arts. There are people that can connect to the spiritual phenomena that might be able to pass. So, it could be some of these cult leaders can actually produce some kind of euphoria or rapture or, you know, some kind of spiritual experience. I'm not a football fan. I'm reliably informed that it's a very religious experience to be with tens of thousands of people at a stadium cheering. It's a euphoria, it's mass hysteria, right? The Beatles, mass hysteria, the 60s, right? Is that a spiritual phenomenon? It's a human phenomenon that people get, you know, rapturous about things, you know? It doesn't, we have a large number of people, it helps also. You know, have you ever been to the Dukhani at the Kotel? Yeah. The Dukhaning at the Kotel, have you been on yeah. Holomo? It's an amazing moving experience. Tens of thousands of Kohanim, all blessing together. It's very moving. It's very inspiring. I guess you washed all their hands. It must have been quite time consuming. It's <laughs> right. It's amazing. You know, it's absolutely amazing. And, and the cynic will say it's because you've got tens of thousands of people there. If you get tens of thousands of people to shout, you know, if you. If if uh, um, if you got ten thousand people standing in a room, and you said, right, I'm going to say David, and you're going to shout Leviki, and you go, David, Leviki, David, it's going to become like a you know a whole uh, what do you call it uh, a cult. That doesn't take much when you have lots and lots of people. So being a charismatic leader. No, what I'm saying is that that's faith. Yeah. <clears throat> right. 
so right so for those on zoom you pass it on here david right so david's asking david's asking about rabbi amnon yitzhak his famous rabbi in israel who um is a bit marmite you love him or hate him some people find him too too in your face and many people claim that they've you know they've transformed their lives overnight inspired by his teachings I'm sure he's genuine there's no suggestion that he's you know any kind of charlatan or fake there's no suggestion that he's uh you know in any way, God forbid, take advantage of people. It's just a certain style that not everyone can, you know, not everyone likes. But genuine, yes. Inspiring people to greater heights, yes. All we're saying is, in the same way that you can create mass hysteria quite easily, the fact that somebody was able to tap into spiritual phenomena and might even have predicted the future or, you know, done some miraculous thing, Pharaoh's magicians also did miracles. So being able to perform miracles and do weird stuff doesn't make you a prophet the key test is that you're preaching the word of god and that it's always for the right reasons that's the key test now, any prophet who you know people say how can hasidim go to the rebbe whatever the rebbe says right so how can hasidim go to their rebbe's and whatever the rebbe does they'll say isn't that you know potentially a very abusive relationship well the answer is yes if they take advantage it works on the premise you won't take advantage Right? The truth is, any rav you go to and you ask for shaila, in theory, you are you are make, you are make yourself vulnerable. There's a, there was a story going around years ago. I don't know if it was fake news about a Muslim who won, I think it was 18, 17 million pounds on the lottery. And he went to his imam. He said, "I have to confess that I was gambling on the lottery." And the imam says, "Oh, that's terrible. That's what they call it, a harem, I think, forbidden. Um, the only remedy is to give all the money to the mosque." <laughs> so, I don't know if that's true or not, but. You know that something smells not quite right there. Yeah, yeah. you know, um, somebody. I I did something for someone recently, um, and they said, "Can I pay you?" I said, "No, honestly, it was a pleasure. It took ten minutes to do. It's just a simple little thing I did for somebody for Jewish nature." Um, they said, "Well, I'd like, I, you know," I said, "Look," I said, "You know what? It was like two weeks ago." I said, "We have a couple of people committed with COVID." I said, "You know what?" Give a donation to Sadaka and let it be in the merit of those who are ill. I said, I don't, I don't care what charity you give. I said, Look, if you want to give it to a shop, I can give you a link. I said, but honestly, whatever charity you choose. Um, and he said, okay, I don't know what he did in the end. But I meant that genuinely. Obviously, it's nice if people give money to a shop, give money for me. But I didn't want it to become a personal you know, thing, right? You know, um, on the other hand, you know, I've had times in my life where you know, I've, I've put myself out for someone. They've said, oh, I'd like to I'd like to make a gesture. So I've given a donation to my favorite charity, the Cat's Home in your honor. I think, well, actually, I'd much rather you would have asked me what charity I want to give it to. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so the, the test of a prophet is not their ability to predict the future or to channel the, because there are even, you know, all kinds of people can do that. The test of a prophet is that they never deviate from the word of God. If they deviate from the word of God, we have a problem. So signs and miracles, I mean, that's a simple test, by the way. And that's how we would deal with all these, you know, modern religions and cults and whatever. The moment they're deviating from the word of God, we have a problem. Now, if you look through Tanakh, um, the fact is that that's not, that's, that's not something that they do. They are faithful to the word of God at all times. Um, okay, also, a prophet has to be a leader. We're going to see that uh, right after Moshe's death was a very challenging time. We'll get to the book of Joshua, hopefully, in due course. It was a very challenging time. The people... They've lost their leader, Moshe. They're going into the land of Israel, right? They've been in the desert where God looked after them with the clouds and, you know, it used to clean their clothes and they had food falling from the sky and water coming from the moon as well. And suddenly now they're going to have to go into the land of Israel and actually work hard for a living. They're going to have to farm and they're going to have to fight wars and conquer the land. They need a very strong leader. And we'll see that uh, Joshua is actually, thank God, going to be that leader. Um, unfortunately, I had to score on Sunday, so we're going to pause at this point. And we're about halfway through what I was going to cover today, which is fine. We'll talk a bit more about profits next week, and then we'll start looking at Joshua. But uh, I will try to get a larger print for next week. I hope that worked okay for everyone at home. And uh, well, it was a bit disjointing, Rabbi. When people okay, so we're in the main shawl. What next week? Hopefully, we'll be in a smaller room, um, and I'll find a better way to do it. It's a work in progress. Right. But, uh, I couldn't hear what you. the questions were, and it was a bit just. No, it's hard to hear people. I have to figure out a way to do that. Okay. And Beryl's on as well. Beryl. So I'll have to figure out a way to do that. This is the new hybrid model that I have to work out. Okay. All right. But yes. thank you for joining us. Yes.
And uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning. I hope so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, God. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Right.